love the story that uh, Ella and Gracie were reading, and uh, we, me and Ella got to watch Charlie Brown Christmas like 700 times or so. I don't know. That and Miracle on 34th Street. How many of you guys are about done with Christmas movies? I don't know, man. You can only see those things so many times. I wonder what it was about Charlie Brown that was so awesome when we were kids, man. Because I look at this cartoon, I'm like, my gosh, surely we could do better than that. Charlie Brown was awesome, though. So we were, uh, we were at Walmart. I was walking through Walmart parking lot yesterday, and uh, um, I saw this car that had all these bumper stickers on the back of it, and it said, uh, Jesus is the reason for the season, and don't leave Christ out of Christmas and all of these things. So it was like, uh, it was really, you know, passion driven, I could tell, you know, about all that. And uh, it reminded me of this thing I saw, I think, I think either Fox or, yeah, it had to be Fox because uh, no other news would have been talking about this. But Fox was talking about, uh, has this war on Christmas, like between Christians and non Christians, and they actually said atheist, but I thought to myself, man, that's really not true, because, like, you got to be a real jack wagon to just be against Christmas. I mean, I don't care what you believe. I mean, you can believe in Jesus, you can be a Christian, but man, I know, like, there's got to be Jewish people out there going, man, Christmas is awesome. You know, I mean, it's like, who won't take a week off work? Like, I mean... Two weeks out of school, who cares what you believe, right? So you got to be like just a person that's against stuff to be against Christmas. But it got me to really consider, and what is this really about? I mean, I'm doing this series this month called Tis the Season. And man, I want to thank Scott, man. Did y'all like Scott last week, Scott Hernandez? Golly, I listened to it. I was like, dude, I, that's good. I'm going to get replaced, man. That's, that's awesome. But as I was uh, thinking through this, what I was going to talk about last week, and we couldn't be here, tis the season for giving. I mean, when you think about what Christmas is and what Christmas is really about, isn't this the season for giving? Because I I don't want to leave Christ out of Christmas, you know, I know Jesus is the reason for the season, but I also know that a bunch of people say that, and a bunch of people put that on their cars, and a bunch of people don't know what the heck they're talking about. It's like, oh, Christmas, we should just remember the little baby was born in the manger. You know, everybody loves baby Jesus. It was the grown-up Jesus we don't like. It was the grown-up Jesus that was talking about giving your lives away. It was the grown-up Jesus that was talking about, you know, putting the needs of others ahead of our own. But, but man, we like, in this season, we like to put Jesus in the manger, and, and that's all cool, and, and, and we do, like, nativity scenes. How many of you guys have seen nativity scenes? Like, everything, when I remember growing up, everything I learned about Christmas and Jesus was from the nativity, Right? I mean, it's just amazing how much stock we put in the nativity. And let me tell you something. There is nothing more inaccurate to the Bible or to reality than the nativity scene. But man, you can't spread it out like it really happened and get it all on one stage and get it all in one hour, right? So we pack all this in and all of a sudden, man, we, we feel good about ourselves because we've done our religious duty. Now let's get on the what's real and right, getting, getting stuff. But I want to I wanna, I wanna think back for a second about what the point was. See, Christmas, Christmas... This time of year is the celebration of redemption, of being made right with God. This is the celebration of the coming of the promised Messiah. See, it's more than a baby being born in a manger. The whole world changed. 
the whole world changed. God was there and earth was here and everything was broken. But God so loved the world that he gave. And that's what it becomes about. And so as I was, I was thinking about our world today and the commercialism of it all, I started thinking, you know, there's a lot of people that are really against the commercial Christmas. But the truth is, this might be the only time of year that, very, that most people actually give anything. And the giving is the point of it all. The giving is the point of it all. And so I was thinking about our nativity in our world today. And as I reflect on nativity, I know the Christmas story, and I'm sure you've all seen the play. You know, most of y'all's hands went up. You've seen nativity. So as we look at it, we find this really dirty, ratty couple coming into this massive metropolitan area. And things were bad, man. Things were bad. These Romans had, had control over the whole world, and they had taken the rights of the Jews, who this was their promised land. This was the land that God had given them. And... They had taken it. But not only that, man, you had more stuff going on. You had these religious people sitting in power, passing their sentences on people, passing their judgments on people, all for their own profits, to make money, to, to get, to burden the people down more. You had these zealots, these wild, crazy guys who had killed more Jews than the Romans, they were running around killing people. This was a tumultuous, tumultuous, golly. The times were in turmoil. Can you get that, man, what's really going on? And you had the Caesars, and you had the high priest, and you had the leaders of these zealots, and they're all running around, they're all in power. And then you had this dirty, ratty couple come in to Bethlehem, a carpenter from Nazareth, a nobody among nobodies, and he goes to his family's place, and they say there's no room in the inn, but the inn, uh, inn literally definition is guest room. There was no guest room available in, in their family's dwelling. See, the way it was then was you would build your house, and when your kids grew up and got married, then you would just add rooms onto your house. And so everybody just kept building on to their father's house. In my father's house, there are many rooms, like you've heard that. Okay, so people would just keep adding on to the rooms, and when they had their families, they'd come back. And So all of these, and then they had this common area. But evidently, because of what was going on, there was this, this overcrowding. So there was no place left except for this place where the animals were where the animals were kept. So Mary and Joseph, of course, have Messiah in a barn and lay him in a feed trough. They had Messiah, I mean, put it in our circumstance. Say you got the whole world spinning, man. Everything's going on. It's crazy, man. And, and it's, it was as crazy in that part of the world at this time as it is in our world at this time. Like, man, I drove past the mall yesterday. It was unbelievably psychotic. And then out of nowhere... The nobodies from nowhere have an insignificant baby in a barn and laying in a feed trough. And the thing was that nobody noticed. 
Then, of course, you know, you had God send the angels because, like, somebody should actually know that this has happened. <laughs> so God sends angels to talk to shepherds who say, wow, that's great. Maybe we ought to go witness this. So they go and they witness the baby in the feed trough. And, man, they're praising God because nobody from nowhere has this baby and lays him in a feed trough. And it just happens to be the one person that everybody had been waiting on for thousands of years. But he wasn't born in a palace. He wasn't flashy. They didn't ride in in a chariot with gold rims and spinners. Spinners. Go way back. This is, this is first century stuff. Nobody from nowhere has an insignificant kid in a barn. And nobody noticed. And I started thinking about Christmas. And I started thinking about if that had happened today, like we condemn people in history. Isn't that hilarious how we condemn people in history as we write our own history? about us being completely oblivious to the world around us and anything that's going on. But we condemn history for not noticing this insignificant kid born in this insignificant place in the world. And I thought in our lives today, would we notice? Would we notice that the world had changed? that heaven was no longer there and earth here, that everything was no longer broken, but that the Redeemer, the Messiah, had come to make everything right again. The Redeemer of the world was born and nobody noticed. So that got me thinking about this other thing. And when I start thinking about other things is where we get in trouble. Because Jesus would have been known and his family in the place they were at, they were the least of these. Wouldn't you say? That would be a good description of all the people in the world. They were the least of these. I don't know the whole, I don't know how many of you guys were born in a barn and laid in a feed trough. So we would have said this would have been less than us, right? We're born in sterile hospitals. Like, you can't have a baby without going to a hospital anymore, right? <laughs> hey, it's going to happen either way. I can just tell you that. <laughs> Save yourself 10 grand. Just let her go. <laughs> That's easy for guys to say, <laughs> right? <laughs> No, it's, it's this insignificant nobodies that I want to talk about, these least of these. Because as Jesus starts to grow up, it starts to look like the very meaning of it all is centered on these top people. You know them. Those people. Them the least of these. It seemed like the Savior of the world was sent to the least of these. Not to the palace, not to the emperors, not to the Caesars, but to the shepherds. The ones who were working on Christmas Eve. They didn't know it was Christmas Eve. I was like, you know, the ones who had to keep their jobs going anyway, the ones who were out making a living, tending the flaws. And, and as the ministry of Messiah Jesus starts, and as the ministry starts to go, it starts to look like the center of all of Christianity becomes about how we treat people. Noticing the dirty, 
noticing the undesirable, noticing and paying particular attention to the have-nots. This becomes like what it seems to be all about. And then in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus starts talking about this kingdom that everybody had been looking for. Because if it's time, everybody could see the signs of the, of the time. And as the, as the seasons start to change and the time comes, everybody's looking for the Messiah, the conquering king, to be born with spotlights and with, and with, with an audience, with, a, with, a, with the whole eyes of the world upon him. Coming in and ruling and reigning and taking over everything. Not the least of these, but the most of these. Which is every trait of Satan. I want the show. I want the glam. I want the glitz. I want the spotlight. I want the center of everything. I want the power. But the anti-Satan... The Christ, the Messiah, is born to humble means. And he grows up, and the rabbi grows up, and he becomes a teacher. And in Matthew chapter 25, in verse, I'm going to be in verse, start in verse 31, Matthew 25, 31. I'm reading in an English Standard Bible. It says this, And when the Son of Man, that's a name, Son of Man is a name that was given in the earliest writings known to humanity for the Messiah, the one who would set the world right, the one who would be anointed by God to redeem mankind, to remove the curse from the garden. And when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. Now, for some reason... In this passage, we shift this to the future. Why would we do that? Well, because everybody says that, right? But you will not find another place in the rest of the New Testament where it does not say that Jesus Messiah is seated on his throne. He is seated on his throne in the heavenlies. So what do we know about this? We know that Jesus was talking about right now, 2,000 years ago, right now. He was showing them something. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and the angels with him, and he will, and he will sit on his glorious throne. The throne is a place of power or a kingdom, the, the place the king who rules the kingdom sits. 39 times in the New Testament, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is now. It's at hand. It's here. It's among you. It's within you. It's upon you. Fifty-something times he says the same thing in translation. The kingdom of God is here. Now it's upon you, among you, within you. Okay? That's a lot. So we can assume a couple of things. One, that when Messiah, Son of Man, comes... And when he is glorified and he sits upon his throne in his kingdom, that that was actually happening within that time. And before him gathered all the nations. And he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. And they call this the parable of sheep and goats. But I want you to understand that he says they are people. Now, I know you're like, duh, I can read into that, right? I know I get the sense that he's not talking about sheep and goats. He's talking about people. The reason I want you to understand that is because we see the imagery, right? It's obvious to everyone in here there's imagery involved, right? The sheep and goats are people, in fact. The king, we would understand to be Messiah. His kingdom would be 
kingdom of heaven, right? Okay, I just want to make sure, man. Like everybody's staring at me like, want to kill me or something. Okay, I just want to get the picture. And it says that he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food and I was thirsty and you gave me drink and I was a stranger and you welcomed me and I was naked and you clothed me and I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer, the righteous meaning those who were right with God. The righteous would answer, saying, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or sick, hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king answered them, truly I say to you, as you did to the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And then he'll say to those on his left, depart from me because you're cursed into the eternal flames or eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food and I was thirsty and you gave me no drink and I was stranger and you did not welcome me and naked and you did not clothe me and sick and in prison, you did not visit me. And they will also answer saying, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? And he will say, answer them saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, those words are very important there. These, and these will go away to eternal. Eternal doesn't mean, it's not meaning forever there. The, it's very important you get what he's saying. You will go away to an abundance, a perpetual, an ongoing punishment. And those righteous ones will go on to an abundant, an ongoing, a, uh, a more better life. And I started thinking about that because there's a couple of things that, that are true. Because I can say they're true. And I can say they're true because you can, you can testify to truth when you experience things, right? I would call myself an eyewitness to certain things. I'm an eyewitness to one fact that the kingdom of heaven is in fact at hand. I'm also a witness to another fact. The kingdom of hell is real and at hand. And if heaven is here now and it is real, then hell is here now and it is real. And what the Messiah was telling us in the parable, in the story, was that there is, there is this judgment. There is this judgment between righteousness and right standing with God and entering into life. And then there is a, an unrighteous judgment of those who are entering into and continuing into perpetual hell. And I think this is really important because a lot of times in Christianity, we get our this ticket punched idea and we put everything after we die and oh well. Look, this is not going to do you any good after you're dead. I want you to understand this today. The heaven and hell are real. They're as real as me and you sitting here while I'm standing. They're real. Okay, that's very important to understand. And it seems from the teaching of Jesus that life and heaven are death and hell are very, very closely related to the least of these. Y'all picking that up? 
Like, what are we doing with the least of these? We would say Christians are people who follow the teachings of Christ or our Messiah, right? And we would say that non-Christians would not. Would that be a fair statement? Okay, so if Christians follow the teaching of Messiah and non-Christians do not, then I would say there are more non-Christians in the church than Christians. How do I know? Because I see the least of these and how they're treated. I see people who live only for themselves and their kingdom. I see people who, who want to come with a blaze of glory and be first and be the biggest and the baddest and the loudest and the most and the everything. The winners. That's our society, man. We love winners. And then I see the humble. I see those who come in with their head down, barely got enough to scrape by, just trying to hold on. And I ask, what do we do with each of these groups? How do you tell? Do you have to win? Tough question, right? Do you have to be first? Do you have to have the best, the biggest, the loudest? Those are tough questions. Or do we humble ourselves? Do we put others first? Do we consider the people in our lives over ourselves? Because it seems to me the season is a season of giving. Now, a lot of people approach the holidays as in a place of, oh, I have to give this, I have to give that. But what if giving was really the point and getting wasn't? What if we judged the happiness of our holidays over what we could give, not over what we could receive? Now, I ain't talking about your kids, man. Everybody's going to give their kids stuff. I'm talking about being a generous giving person. This is the season for giving. I think this is, a, this is really comical to me because politically speaking, we have two parties in our country generally, but it's funny to me that the Democratic Party, which is known as the party of Satan, I mean, in general terms, I mean, uh, to the media and whatever. They're the ones who care about the poor and the needy and those who don't have the have-nots. And, the, and so their political views are take from the wealthy and give to, to the poor, the have-nots. Now, it's all good and great in theory, but when it turns to politics, and, and politics will never work. That's why we don't talk about politics here in the church, because politics never solved anything. But that's the theory of the party of Satan. And we would say that, we would say as we look at all these activists, and we call that, use that as a, like a dirty word, right? That all these activists who are about equal rights and about equal pay and who are about fairness and about, and about welfare and things like that, we would say, you know, they're the party of the devil. Then we got the religious right-wing nuts that are like, you know, this country was built on God and this and that and whatever, and it's every man for himself. Okay. But we would say these are the people that are predominantly Christian. Like the Republican Party is known, it's the Christian Party. But I have to look at and I say to myself, what are we calling Christian? 
because these people over here hate church, despise church, would call themselves atheists because these people over here and the way they act. And these people say these people are the devil because we go to church and we know the Bible and we stand for God and we worship flags and, and those types of things, right? But then I look at Jesus who's not political at all and says, what are you doing with the least of these? Not what's your political agenda or stance because what you find out in politics, everything's about power. Everything's about power and money. See, this side is just selling this because it gives more power and money, and this side is just selling this because it gives more power and money. And if you're into politics, that's all you're into. You're promoting and supporting people who are about power and money. Because the idea of politics is to keep your job. If things really change, politicians would be out of work. So why would politicians want things to change? You want change in your world? Make the change in your life. If you want to see change in the world, start caring about somebody other than yourself. We've got to level out, guys. We, we've got to level out. We've got to start noticing the baby in the feed trough. We are so busy and so consumed that if the baby was in a feed trough in our world today, we would not notice. And that makes us wrong. That makes us the religious people of the temple. But we want to be shepherds. We want to be shepherds in the field people who are taking care of their business and taking care of their lives, but stop to witness the change that's going on in the world. Change in the world doesn't come from the top. It never has and it never will. Change in the world comes from the bottom. Change in the world comes from the least of these. You know, our country was founded by the least of these. The least of these. The people who were tired of being oppressed and being put down and being pushed to the bottom. People who said, I've had enough. We want a country where every man is created equal. We want a country where it's not about what we have, but about what we give. We want a country where we share equally among ourselves. That was the vision. But that was the vision of Messiah. People will say to me all the time, look around you, Todd, the kingdom of heaven. This cannot be it. There's still so much hurt and so much suffering and so much going on in our world. There are kids starving to death. Well, my question is, what are you doing about it? I mean, anybody can sit around and complain. What are you doing about it? See, the haves and the have-nots, there's enough supply for everyone. But this small group has and controls everything, and the large group needs everything. We just want a little more, just a little more. But when do we come to the point where we get fanatical about giving? I mean fanatical about giving. What would Canton, Texas look like today if people gave? If people took care of each other. I had people come into church all the time. Here's the sad thing. They used to come in all the time for money. Like, hey, man, we need some money. Can you help us out? Uh, you know, I was driving across country, and I ran out of gas, and I don't have enough to get there. I'm like, dude, you got to plan your trips better. Well, it's just... But now people come in asking for food. Do you have any clothes? Do 
See, it's getting real. And the thing is, we all have stuff. We all have extra. Thing is, we don't give, man. We don't give. I'll tell you this. This is the only thing I know about the giving of this church. This is the only thing I know. I don't know how much anybody gives. I know about what the offering is every year. There's one thing I do know, though, that we average 20 givers a weekend. Twenty people give. What does that tell you? Well, it tells you we're not a very giving church. Why? Because we don't even return to God what's His. The sad thing is, if everyone just gave what they were supposed to, if everyone just gave their tenth, there would be such a surplus of money we could give and help and provide for hundreds of people. But that's a long shot. And, and the, the thing is, it's not just us. I mean, this ain't the first church I've been in. It's every church. The church could stomp out could stomp out hunger if the people in the church gave. If Christians did what Jesus taught, which is by the very definition of Christian, right? If Christians did what Jesus taught, there wouldn't be need among us. This is the season for giving. But here's, here's what I want to leave you with. I look at the church and I struggle so bad because people's lives are so jacked up. And it, it bothers me. I mean, it bothers me to the bone. How, how hurting, how messed up people's lives are, how far down people have gone. And I look around and I see hell in people's lives. And hell outnumbers heaven by such a huge majority in the church today. And then I look at the teaching of Jesus and I go, oh, wait. Those who care for the least of these have heaven and those who don't have hell. And then it makes sense. I can look at my own giving and see my heaven and hell, heaven and hell, heaven and hell. How much am I caring for the least of these? Heaven and hell, heaven and hell. How self-consumed am I? Heaven and hell, heaven and hell. And what we don't realize because it's so countercultural is that the amount of heaven that you experience here in this world has everything to do with what you do with the least of these. It's not whether you go to church or read your Bible or do good, you know, say the right thing, sing the right songs, listen to the right radio stations, slap the right bumper stickers on your car, wear the right t-shirts. Has nothing to do with heaven and hell at all. From what Jesus said, heaven and hell is way more dependent on what I'm willing to deny myself and do. How much of myself am I willing to give away? How's that for a kick in the teeth Christmas message? <laughs> That's what it's about. And here's why I share this with you. Because I want this next year to be the greatest year of your life. I want you on top. On top. Because 
The only way we can be on top is to deny ourselves and give our lives away. Where's my money going? Where's my time going? Where's my energy and effort? Where's the central focus of my life going? If the central focus of all your life is on you, I will tell you from the teachings of Jesus where that road goes. But man, when we consider others, and when we get excited about being, I mean giving, like I get so excited at Christmas, I'm like, man, I just want to give everything. And then I give my kids too much and spoil them. So I'm going to take all their presents and give them away this year. <laughs> no. There's nothing wrong with giving your kids stuff. There's nothing wrong with having stuff. But what's the driving point of your life? That's what you got to look at. What's driving you? I don't know. I just know for me, man, I want to live in heaven. I want it all. I want everything that Jesus said heaven was. And I've read the teachings, and I know that it makes no sense in this world. But it's about time to be countercultural, isn't it? It's the season for giving. Let me pray for you guys, and then we'll, we'll uh, go have a holly jolly Christmas.